Well, this was quite a chapter. First of all, it's Kuma's flashback time, which I'm so devastated already. It has started off with so much pain. But on top of that, Oda gave me a buggy cover page. I think this chapter was for me. I usually don't talk about the cover pages. I just dive straight into the chapter, but it's buggy. So I just have to mention it. So first off, the chapter starts off with Saturn holding on to Bonnie after she has stabbed him, grabbing a hold of her, squeezing her. Everybody's freaking out. Bonnie, how could you? Do you realize who you just attacked? And Saturn saying, pipe down insects. If I were afraid of her sword, I would have avoided it. And then displaying for us that he can heal his own wounds, which I love. I love the idea of having this new, already huge, imposing, can potentially blow your head off kind of enemy that also can easily heal his own wounds. He's not afraid of getting hurt because he can heal up easily. So this adds a really interesting layer to his character because one, that means that any punch we throw, any stab we make, any attack we do could easily, he'll just take it and then close up that wound and keep moving. Love that. But then the fact that there are four more of these, eventually we're going to have to, I mean, I realize right now we're just dealing with Saturn, but eventually we're gonna have four more that we have to deal with. And I want Saturn to be this strong. I want him to have unique abilities like the ability to heal his own wounds easily because that means that our fights have to get creative too. And already our fights are getting so much more interesting, at least to me, because of this Looney Tunes gear fifth it's just causing the fights to look different, which I'm really happy about. But now on top of that, our opponent looks really different too, which is great. Both Kizaru and Luffy are down and they're both down hard. I mean, we know about Luffy's uh, time limit uh, with having used gear fifth and, and running out of energy. But Kizaru also says, I don't think I'll be mobile anytime soon. So they really are pretty much perfectly evenly matched. And I wonder when Luffy does get back up, will Kizaru get back up too? Or is he going to stay down? I love this scene where Saturn nearly steps on Luffy, nearly completely takes him out. And Frankie's way of saving him is to punch Luffy out of the way, grab a hold of him, bring him back, and, and then laugh and say, oh, even the strongest forces in the world want our captain? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Our captain's pretty neat. Like, I love that very casual, you punched him. Luffy can't move for himself and you punched him out of the way and then bragged on the fact that everybody wants a piece of our captain. <laughs> I know it's small, but I will take literally any emphasis on the crew at this point. Give me, give me those crew moments, please, I beg of you. Saturn has been given such cool lines from the moment he decided to come to Egghead Island. He continually says, I mean, Saturn's horrible, don't get me wrong, but he has the coolest lines. And this one, which of you should I kill first? Tell me from least to most painful. I want you to die with nothing but regret for your rebellion against the world government. That's so good. That's such a good evil line. And the fact that on top of being super strong, we're being stabbed right in the chest doesn't affect him. The fact that he can close up his wounds really easily. The fact that he's clearly very powerful, but on top of that, he can also just freeze anyone. Like none of them are able to move now just because he wills it. I'm loving the power of Saturn. And then when Bonnie says again, you killed my father, and he responds by telling us about Kuma, the fact that he was a part of a slave race. This is a group of people, a clan that once committed a grave crime against the world, and he's the last survivor of the Buccaneers. So, so this group of people once committed a grave crime against the world, which could mean literally anything for the Celestial Dragons. They committed a grave crime and because of that, their entire group, their entire people group, group were enslaved. And now he's the last survivor. What does that mean? Does that mean that they were hunted down? Does that mean that they were exterminated? They were just slaughtered? Is it just because they were so careless and ruthless with their slaves that they just 
killed them so cavalierly that there's none left. I don't know. We're probably going to find out somewhat, but that launches us into the flashback. So we find out that the legend of Sun God Nika, the warrior of liberation, has been passed down by uh, through the buccaneers and that he's the hope that they've been leaning on which begs so many questions like kuma when he protected their ship back when he protected back in sabayoti and essentially risked his life for this was it because he already knew did he i mean luffy hadn't had his fruit, his devil fruit awakened yet. He didn't know that he was Sun God Nika yet. The drums of liberation, the dom da da dom da da dom that he that they chant in this chapter wasn't happening yet. Did he somehow know though? Because it's possible, based off of just the beginning of this flashback, we can speculate a lot about who knew about whose devil fruit and how many people are in the know about this particular about the gum gum fruit. Is that why he's allied himself with Luffy? Is that why he's done all he's done up to this point? Because he saw Luffy for who he was. And that also begs the question, because I really think that when we come out of Kuma's flashback, that's when Kuma is going to arrive on Egghead Island. We have Bonnie right now being held up by, um, by Saturn in the air, basically firing squad. Everybody aim for her head. Which, by the way, if you're a member of that firing squad and you have Saturn holding someone up and he's like, aim for the head. Who's going to be the guy that ends up hitting his hand and then gets your head exploded? Anyway, um, she's lined up for firing squad right now to pay for having attacked Saturn. So, I don't know. It just seems like the end of this flashback is probably going to be Kuma coming in, Luffy standing back up, getting his energy back, and... Kuma's going to see his daughter be saved by his hero, the one that he's been waiting for, the liberator of freedom, the one that he has modeled his life after to be able to help those who are, um, how did he put it? Save the imprisoned and suffering. The one that Kuma has looked up to his whole life being the one to save his daughter from death. I mean, what an arrival that would be, right? Anyway, we launch into the full flashback here. We see Kuma as a baby and he's so cute. And because of his blood, because of his birth, because of who he is born as, he they immediately come into the hospital and enslave him. And he has been enslaved from birth. So we have a lot of really, really painful imagery in this chapter from... Um, his mom holding him, comforting him. I can hear her sweet voice saying, it'll be all right, dear, with Kuma smiling. They're all in chains. His dad bloody and broken and bruised with the chain around his neck behind him while his mom is comforting him and while they're all, it's okay, everything's fine. We get to see those flashes of the flashback that we got from Bonnie. We get to see those images more clearly now and get the full context around what we saw just snippets of uh, chapters ago, as well as while we see Kuma getting beaten up and crying and yelled at, and then his dad with a smile on his face, broken and bloody, asking him, hey Kuma, how's it going? And he says, my master is kind and gentle. Liar. <laughs> and we all know it and his dad knows it. His dad's looking at him and seeing how beat up and broken Kuma is too. And his dad's just smiling and they both know. They both are aware that Kuma's being mistreated, but they're choosing these lies for the sake of each other's comfort. And this is the way Kuma was raised. This was Kuma's entire childhood from the hospital. These are the only memories he has. He has no memory of freedom. He has no men memory of kindness outside of violence. This is it for him. This is his whole life. And then his dad tells him, your mother's dead, son. She's in heaven now, but I think she's better off that way. Like. That's so heartbreaking, not just because of the faces that Oda draws, not just because of the tears and the pain that we're seeing them suffer through, but the fact that his dad has to just very bluntly tell him, your mom's gone, and we know that she was probably killed by being beaten to death. Like, we know it wasn't a natural passing or possibly from being shot just on a whim, just like we're about to see. And the fact that his dad has to just tell him that, so just, okay, 
here's the news because this is just life for them. Life for them is so fleeting. And then he follows it up by, she's better off that way, which is true. Honestly, what they suffer day in and day out, that's not a revelation to Kuma. I'm sure he agrees. In fact, he says, I'd rather be dead too. So his dad cheers him up while they're chained to this post. Uh, it's him and Kuma and several other slaves. You can see the post in the ground and they're all chained to it. And he cheers him up by telling him about the myth of Sun God Nika, the warrior of liberation, the one that will set us free. And he's he's doing the doom da da doom da da doom, he trying to cheer him up. And then off panel, he's shot because he was making too much noise. Off panel, he dies. And Kuma goes from laughing to empty eyed. The, the smile is still there, but it's not really there anymore because he just watched his father be shot in front of him for no reason. This is the way Kuma grew up. This is his childhood. This is the only truth he's ever known of the world. Kuma is a character that I'm very attached to. He's a character that I have loved for a long time and been waiting for this. I mean, we all have. We've all been waiting for his flashback for a long time, but I knew it would hurt, but this, this one really hurts. And Oda is so good, not only at these big emotional moments, not only at drawing all this emotion out of us, but he's so good at showing a reprehensible person or group of people, someone that is horrible and that we hate and that we're just disgusted by in such a short period of time. And the Celestial Dragons we've known for a long time, we've seen some really vivid imagery of their cruelty, but he just amped it up to 11 in this chapter with them doing their annual man hunts, their annual native hunting, where they go to a land that belongs to a people native to that land and slaughter them for a game, for a game. So this time they choose God Valley. We're finally introduced to God Valley. And why did they choose it? Because it dares to call itself the Valley of Gods. We see Saint Figurlin Garling, Moonhead. <laughs> we see him just casually killing people, just casually killing the king of this land because he dared talk back. And the casual way that they respond to that, ah, oh, you killed the king of this native group of people before it was time, eh, penalty of 10,000 points. That's it, that's the punishment. Because this is a game, because they're entitled, because these people are nothing more than a sport to them. And that's all the value they hold because they're so high that they deserve to treat people this way. They deserve to hunt people for sport. And they'll go ahead and throw out some criminals and some disobedient slaves. Well, they'll throw them out into the arena as well, just for the fun of it. He really emphasizes how horrible, how prideful, how disgusting these people are and how lowly they view the rest of the world and how little they care about human lives. We also see a glimpse of Saturn who looks exactly the same, which kind of reinforces this immortality sort of theory about the elders, or at least that they're hundreds of years old if he's really not aging over this period of time. I know a lot of people are theorizing that Garland is Shanks's dad, which means that if that's true, that we're gonna get some more backstory on Shanks's origins as well and potentially see him getting put in that trunk and sent off to sea by Garland maybe because it's possible that he's repulsed by uh, uh, Garling. I just combined his names, didn't I? Garling, Figurland Garling. By Moonhead, Moonhair, um, potentially because maybe he's repulsed by this life that he's kind of bought into and he doesn't want this for his kid or potentially maybe Shanks's mom sent him off because she's repulsed by it. Who knows, either way, we might get some more information on that. But once again, we cut back to um, kind of filling out the flashes of flashback that we got from Bonnie. We see uh, Kuma being dragged back because if he runs away, then they all get punished. And who do we see? Ivankov. Of course we see Ivankov. He was a slave. He too was enslaved since childhood. And he's exactly the same. He 
acts and looks exactly the same. He's still this presence of joy, of hope, of we, we're gonna find some solutions. I can just feel the presence of someone who is going to, is going to find a way out of prison, who's going to find a way out of capture, who's going to provide a place of hope and joy in the midst of hell, just like he did in Impel Down. I just, he's, we're gonna watch him play that role again in this flashback. Plus we have Ginny, who I have been, I have been told, a lot of people are speculating is Bonnie's mom, which is certainly possible because this is a Kuma flashback, so it could happen. But whoever she is, she gonna die. And I'm sure she will convince us all to love her very deeply before she does. But this flashback, this chapter was incredible because it reinforces and in fact further establishes how grotesque, how disgusting our enemy truly is. I mean, we knew this, but it only establishes it that much more strongly. It begins a tragic emotional flashback at the hands of our enemy. So we're reinforcing how badly these people need taken down through the eyes of an innocent child and someone we love. A flashback that we've been waiting for that ties into what the story is moving towards. Plus, we have the promise of some greater world building questions that we've had for so long that could be all answered here in this flashback through the eyes of someone that we care about so much. We could potentially see Big Mom give Kaido his devil fruit. We'll see. We could potentially see uh, Shanks, uh, Roger find Shanks in the treasure chest. I know some people were speculating that the chests that we saw in this chapter had devil fruits in them, which is certainly possible. I don't know, Shanks could be in one. This is our opportunity to see the conflict at God Valley. Uh, we know that the celestial dragons are wiping out this entire people group on God Valley. What do they do when they do these annual man hunts, when they do these, these annual um, finding the natives and wiping them out? What do they do with the land? I assume they claim it as one of their territories, so this is their territory now, and eventually Rox is going to come in and try to conquer it because he wants to be the king of the world. He wants to have control. He wants to have power, supposedly. That's what we think at this point. So he comes in and does this, and then Garp and uh, Roger team up to stop Rox and crew and company. It also should be noted that at least as far as I remember it, the Rox incident, it said that Roger fought to protect the slaves. So when Garp and Roger teamed up, I don't know if it was Garp's, if Garp was just doing his job or if he too had the same motivations as Roger, but them fighting against Rox was a matter of, it was for the slaves. At least I could be remembering that wrong, but at least as far as I remember, that's what Roger's motivation was. So it was for these innocents that are just fodder in this war, essentially, or at least that's how they're treated and Roger wanted to treat them differently. We might see Whitebeard get his scar. We might see Garp get his title. We might see um, uh, Dragon get his inspiration to form the revolutionary, the revolutionaries as well as Kuma and Ivankov joining up. I mean, there's so much opportunity. There's so many things that have just been hinted at, that have just been shown in small batches and small pieces. This is the opportunity to see it all through the eyes of Kuma. How cool would that be if we just got all of that in this one flashback? My hope, our hope, is that this will be a nice long flashback that will really elaborate on so many things that we've had questions on that Oda has hinted at for so long. Anyway, this chapter ended up being more information on how strong uh, Saturn truly is, and the setup for Bonnie getting ready to be killed, leading us into this flashback that is that further establishes our enemy, further establishes uh, the victims in this war, the reason we're fighting, the reason we want the enemy to be taken down is because of the way they treat the innocent and because of the casualty that they that they treat human life, the 
the disrespect, the, dis the, the lack of care that they have for human life. It, it further establishes why we want to see these, these structures crumble. And it's through the eyes, through the, spec the, the perspective of an innocent child and one that we already know and care about. So it, it reestablishes, it puts us back in the mind of what we're doing here, what this series is leading to and why we should care. And then on top of that, it gives us the promise of further answers to questions that we've had for so long. Honestly, it was such a tremendous chapter because it gave us the emotions that we knew we were gonna get out of Kuma. Like we knew his story was gonna be tragic and we're only at the beginning of it. We still haven't even established him being a king and apparently a tyrannical one. There's still so much for us to unpack in Kuma's story itself, um, which I don't really, We'll, we'll see, we'll see how, how tyrannical he really was. But anyway, there's, we knew it was going to be a sad story and Oda delivered on those emotions that we One Piece nerds are addicted to, but it also, re, it, it reminded us, don't forget what we're doing here. Don't forget what our goal is. Don't forget who our enemy is and why we want them brought down. And there's, it's all going to take place on God Valley. So watch out all the world building I've been giving you. We're not done. What an excellent chapter. What an excellent chapter this was and how many more excellent chapters do we have yet to come? What did you think? <laughs> how did you like the chapter? Please chat with me more about it in the comments. I post videos every Monday and Friday on this channel, Tuesdays and Thursdays on the review channel, which is always linked in the description. I'll see you again soon, bye.